Uh, hi, everyone. So my name's Tomer. Uh, I'm an engineer at Yelp. I've been working on our APIs, specifically our public APIs, for the past two years. Uh, more recently, I built GraphQL under our public API, and today I'm going to show you what that kind of looks like. Um, before I get started, I try to cover a lot of topics really fast, so if anybody has any questions or wants to talk afterwards, just find me or shoot me an email. So Yelp's mission, if you're not familiar, is to connect people with great local businesses. So if you want to find a new bar or a new restaurant, we try to facilitate that. So in the beginning, we had this API called API v2, and it was a pretty massive API. The endpoints had tons and tons of fields in it. It was very messy. It was very hard to deal with. And for a while, it kind of just seemed like our design pattern was anytime somebody requested more data, we would just put it inside the endpoint. And if you've ever built an API for a partner or for a mobile client, you've kind of gotten this feeling before. People don't want to make multiple requests. They want to make one request and get all the data they want. And as a developer, that makes your life really, really hard. So this is where GraphQL came in. Um, I know there's been a couple talks on GraphQL over the past day, so I won't dive into the super basics. But effectively, if somebody wanted to get uh, business data, they could get name, alias, and gating, no problem. Maybe they want to get reviews too. Uh, maybe they want to get um, hours and not the alias. That's fine. Maybe they want to get more than one business, also fine. Or maybe they want to get the categories of businesses off of reviews that users wrote on the Yelp business. I don't know why you would ever want to make this query, but one thing I've learned is you can never predict what people are going to do with your API. So to cover some basic vocab, uh, query is just the representation of data you want returned uh, from the API. It's what you send to the back end and what we process. Uh, the schema is the representation of your data structure. So this is what the, what the data is going to look like. Uh, fields are all the data tied to the schema, so this is specifically what you can request out of the query. So business name, alias, rating are all fields. Uh, resolvers are the functions that retrieve data for the field in the query. They're basically the workhorse of GraphQL. They do all the processing, all the data loading, all the query handling. So how does this all work? Um, this is our setup. So. We have a dedicated public API service. Uh, it runs on Python 3.6. Uh, we use the Graphene library, which is the Python GraphQL implementation. Uh, there is going to be a version of this basically any language you want to use. Uh, the service itself runs on Pyramid and um, If you're not familiar with Pyramid, it's Python's version of Sinatra or Express. Uh, we have a pretty complex microservices architecture. Uh, we run a couple hundred services in production. Uh, and we have no attached database to the public API service itself. So everything is powered through different API calls. So I'm going to focus on the first four points and walk through what the actual uh, GraphQL code looks like. So let's pretend we're making this pretty simple query into the endpoint. Uh, we're going to post to the GraphQL endpoint with uh, looking for a business Yelp with name, alias, and reviews. Uh, this is our view. It's a slightly simplified version. It's missing a couple things like verifying that you're in the beta and some validation, but it kind of gets the point across. So I'll break this down. Uh, the first inter interesting part is this decorator. Um, this decorator is used to verify that you have access to the API. Uh, if you're not familiar with Python decorators, they're effectively functions that wrap other functions so that you can always execute specific code before and after. Uh, the decorator looks like this. Uh, nothing too, too crazy. It pulls the access token out of the header validates the token through our OAuth service. If everything works fine, we inject the client into the request. And if, if it's all valid, then we execute. So this specific wrapped part is the actual view I showed you before. Uh, you can see it's just a function. And the code before and after is the decorator itself. So back to the view. Uh, the first thing we do is we instantiate this schema called query. Uh, this query schema is actually the top level that you expose inside of your API. So here we define business and search, and there's probably five or six other top-level fields that we define uh, for reviews, for business matching, for event lookups, and so on and so forth. Um, diving into the first one, you can see that we called business a field, so we know it's exposed. Uh, the second argument is, or sorry, the first argument is the business class. This is the response of the field being returned. And then the second argument, alias, is the actual arguments that the field supports. So this is the business resolver. Uh, this is, like I said, where all the data is going to get loaded. So 
First thing we have here is this decorator. It's very similar to the one I showed you before. Uh, this is how we track how people are requesting different fields. Uh, it's how we do rate limiting. You have to reconsider rate limiting with GraphQL since it's very flexible and normal request counts don't work. Uh, so the next thing is this data load. So like I said, everything we do is through service calls. Um, we have internal API client libraries uh, that we use pretty much everywhere. So we're instantiating the client library. We're making a request to the internal API to get the business data and then returning it. Uh, the last thing we do is we queue up the, the, the data loader with the return business ID. Um, I'll dive into data loaders in a little bit and explain what exactly they are. So as a quick side note, everything I'm doing is Python, but this translates pretty universally across all languages. So you can see this JavaScript example has top level query. It defines a field business. Uh, it has a response type of business class, and it still has a resolver. So everything I'm saying in this talk, you should be able to apply to any language you're using if you're building GraphQL API. So back to the view. Uh, next thing we do is we're pulling the locale out of the header. Uh, we use the accept language header to handle localization. For us, it was easier to say, OK, localization is just going to be once, uh, and it'll apply to the whole query instead of letting people localize individual businesses. Uh, next thing we do is we set context. So with GraphQL, you can set a global state that's applied to all resolvers. Uh, resolvers don't share knowledge on which resolvers get executed or what the query itself looks like. So you tend to have to pass some data around. Um, specifically, we give it the raw request in case any of the resolvers want to get the headers. We give it the client itself so the resolvers can see what client's actually requesting data. And we instantiate a bunch of data loaders, which again, I'll cover in a little bit. Uh, the last thing that happens is we actually execute the schema itself. So with the query we had before, this goes into the top level query class, it hits the business resolver, and then the business resolver returns this business schema. So this business schema also has its own fields and its own resolvers. So top level, very high level, this is what it looks like. Query comes into the view, goes in the query schema, hits the business resolver, from the, uh, which goes to the business schema, hits the individual resolvers inside of there. Each resolver has its own data loader, which goes into the services. Cool, so I've mentioned data loaders a bunch of times now. Uh, what exactly are they? So GraphQL is just spec. It doesn't really define the technical implementation of how you build the API itself. So what you end up doing is, in some naive implementations, you'll hit what everyone calls the M plus one problem. So the M plus one problem is when you make really inefficient data loading by making a bunch of really sequential calls instead of batching or doing anything smarter than that. So in this case, you have a bunch of cats, and for each cat, you want to load a hat. So instead of doing uh, select from hat where cat ID equals one, comma, two, comma, so on and so forth, you're doing these multiple select statements. So with GraphQL, someone can come in and say, cool, I actually want to load six different businesses at the same time. And that could correspond to six different internal API calls. Uh, if you're doing this at any volume, you're pretty much guaranteed to DDoS yourself. So what you have to do is use these things called data loaders. So data loaders are an abstraction layer to load data inside of your resolvers. Uh, they handle batching IDs and deferring execution until all of your data has been aggregated. So when we go back to this uh, query, instead of having these six sequential calls, what it'll do is it'll give you all six IDs in one go so that you can make one request instead of six. Uh, this will make your downstream databases and APIs way happier. No one will be on fire. No one will be getting paged at 2 in the morning. Much better. So inside the view, we have this this uh, context where we instantiated data loaders. This is actually just a very dumb class. Um, it doesn't really do anything except map names of data loaders to the data loaders themselves, uh, so that all the context, so that each individual resolver has context on what data loaders are available to it. Uh, this is what a data loader looks like. Um, all in all, it's not too bad. Uh, this might look scarier than it actually is. The thing that you really want to pay attention to is this batch load function. Uh, this is sort of where uh, it does the aggregation itself. So the biz IDs parameter that's passed in is the list of every business ID that's been called uh, so that you can make one request. Get businesses info is our internal API call that gets all the business data from however and many businesses that you request. Uh, we do a quick mapping so that we can map the business ID requested to the actual entity, and then we return a list of promises. Uh, since data loaders uh, defer execution, the, it uses promises to handle um, actually waiting on the results. So inside of our query, resolver, uh, query business resolver, we go back to this data loaders call. 
So context data loaders is just the mapping, business is the name, and load is the function on data loaders that does ID aggregation. Um, there's a lot of magic happening under the hood with data loaders themselves, so I won't dive too much into that. Uh, each language kind of implements it differently, like JavaScript uses ticks, Python uses um, promises. Uh, it's a little bit complicated for each one. So that's what a lot of the code looks like. Uh, I want to dive into how this actually fits into our service architecture. So a lot of you are probably familiar with microservices. Uh, with GraphQL, it's pretty nice. Each data loader effectively goes into an individual endpoint inside of its own service. So there's a very clear separation of data owners. It's very obvious who's, uh, who owns what's part of, of that uh, data loading. Um, since every data loader goes into its own endpoint, you get very granular control over the data loading itself. Uh, and that lets you get into some pretty uh, powerful query uh, planning and execution. So in some cases, you might want to say, OK, these three service calls I want to execute in parallel, but these three service calls I want to execute sequentially because maybe these three service calls are very slow. So you can start doing graph planning for queries to services based on how you want them to actually execute. Um, we also do a lot of service caching. Uh, we have this thing called request budgeting, which I'll dive into. And you get pretty easy failure handling and retries with uh, GraphQL, too. So service caching. Uh, we built a network caching proxy at Yelp called Spectre. So it's a pretty generic caching service. Uh, and it can apply to any service, wraps to anyone. Uh, it sits effectively in between the data loader and the service call itself. So since you're handling a lot of uh, network requests, you don't want to have to keep making those requests over and over and over again if you're seeing the same data frequently. So this service handles that for everyone. And since you're going to be making bulk calls a lot, one thing we did add to the service was the ability to cache bulk endpoints. If you've ever tried to, had, uh, tried to handle caching bulk endpoints, you know it's kind of hard. So what we ended up doing was we don't cache the response itself. We cache based on entity. So we tell the Spectre service that each entity is correlated to this ID called business ID. It parses the response, and it stores a cache of each entity itself. So when we see a request for business IDs 123, or if we see a request to business IDs 213, it uses the same cache data. Uh, this was pretty critical for us, since caching GraphQL at CDN level is really, really hard, uh, as we discussed yesterday. And caching APIs in general is really hard, given the request signature can be very, very different. So we opted to cache at the data loading level instead of at the um, CDN level. So this is how this kind of works. Uh, top one is just a normal service call. So data loader makes a straight request into the service gets a response back, nothing fancy. The second one is with Spectre involved. So data loader makes a request into Spectre. If Spectre sees a cache, it returns that data. The last one is cache miss. So it initially makes a request into the Spectre. Spectre doesn't see that data, so it proxies the request into the service. The service returns the data back to the data loader, and then Spectre gets a cache of that data. So I mentioned this thing called request budgets. Request budgets are a new concept that we've added at Yelp. We've started rolling this out within the past couple of weeks. And what this does is it guarantees a maximum ex uh, execution time for a query itself. Uh, with GraphQL, this has become very critical given the flexibility of the queries themselves. So we can say, we don't want any queries to execute more than one second. If they do, let's fail them. So in this case, we set the, one, the maximum budget to one second. Some sleep function takes about half a second, and we've got about half a second in budget remaining. So everything works fine. In this case, the budget is one second, but we have some function that takes a second and a half, so we're actually negative 500 milliseconds uh, in terms of budget. So everything downstream fails. If this happens on the first service call, then we can skip executing the next six service calls. Uh, this has been really nice. It just avoided a lot of wasted processing power when requests end up timing out. So easy ha uh, failure handling. Uh, GraphQL requests can partially succeed. Um, you might be asking yourself, what are you talking about right now? So in GraphQL, you have a lot of flexibility with how the resolvers work. Um, query execution doesn't have to be all or nothing like it might be in a REST API, where if one endpoint call throws an exception, everything might blow up. Uh, resolvers execute item potently of everything else. So one resolver can fail, and the whole query itself can still work. So as an example, you might have this query where you're getting name, rating, reviews, and hours. Uh, the hour service might be down, so you can still get data for everything else. The hours field will be null, and then you'll have this field called errors that has a description and error code. So that's pretty cool, right? You know, you can still give people some partial functionality. Maybe hours is not a critical part of their flow. That'll be up to the client to determine. But that makes some other failure cases tricky. Uh, as an example, 
request data for this obviously fake business, one, two, three, fake street. Uh, this is a HTTP 200, but it's returning uh, not found. Normally on a REST API, this is probably 404, right? On, on GraphQL, it's up to the client to parse the body, to extract the errors field, to determine what's going on. You can't rely on status codes as much as you used to. Uh, we still use status codes some, for some very obvious failures, so we'll still return uh, 429s on gate limit exceeds. We'll still return 500s if we have service outages, or 504s if the request time's out. So there's some give and take there, but it's not, it's not as easy as it was. Uh, so the last thing I'm going to cover is securing the API. Um, this is a very wide topic right now. In GraphQL, there's a lot of discussion happening around how to do this. So some of the things I've covered already, uh, bulk endpoints minimize the number of queries. When someone sends you a query that has 1,000 businesses maybe, you don't want to be executing one request per business coming in. You want to have as uh, much bulk endpoints happening uh, or returning data as much as possible. Um, even one non-bulk endpoint can be catastrophic in terms of uh, failures. If you can imagine a query that has a five recursive deep chain and the very bottom of the chain is a non-bulk endpoint, you could be making thousands of uh, requests to load all the data. Um, so network level caching also helps a lot. You don't want to be making continuous requests. If people are making recursive calls, they might be requesting the same data for the same business over and over and over again. Having caching on the network level ensures that you're not making wasteful requests. Uh, limiting the maximum query size, so someone might come in and say, okay, I want every field for every business. The query might be like two or three million businesses big. Obviously, that's not something you want to execute, both for performance sake and for scraping, uh, scraping problems. So you might say, okay, well, we're actually going to step back a little bit. You can only get 500 fields at a time. Uh, maybe we'll also limit the maximum recursion, so you can say, we're only going to let you get five or six resources at a time. You don't want to let people basically scrape the API. That's big, was one of our major concerns. Um, and then lastly, per resolver level authentication. So we've got a pretty crude implementation of this right now. Effectively, when you go inside of the resolver, we extract the client and we check the client if it has access. So at the top one, if the client has access to encrypted IDs, we return them. If not, it does nothing. Um, the second one, if they have access to full reviews, we'll return the full review context. If not, then we might return a snippet. Uh, how you would actually want to handle this is using something called middleware, which I didn't really get a chance to dive into, but they're, they're effectively code that reacts the execution of a resolver before and after, so you can check before whether it has the proper scopes to load the data, and if it does, execute the resolver in its entirety. If not, just pass. Um, and that's actually all of it. We're not taking questions now. We're going to do that after.